Uh, uh, your host, if you will take and put your cursor on my picture. Yeah, I already got and it started. And then the three little dots. Okay. All right. It'll, it's going to save on your computer, though. Well, you know, at least we got it, and I'll send it to you. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, everybody, welcome, and it was good to meet everybody. Uh, at least I got to see your smiling faces. Uh, my name is Jim Frame. I'm your EMS medical director for PERCOM, and I'm also an emergency physician and have been for almost 30 years now. And I enjoy teaching these kind of classes. Uh, this is a great format. I think this is probably one of the best programs we've ever worked with. So in the lecture series that will be kept online for your later reference, uh, this would be the toxicology and substance abuse. Jane, are you drinking already there? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's that Honduras stuff. <laughs> That's funny as hell. All right. Well, listen, if you're having a drink, I'm going to have one too. So, you know, it's no problem. All right. Uh, what we want to do today is uh, toxicology and substance abuse. Now, in your Brady book, this is uh, about 37 pages, call it 40. And so what we're going to do is break this up into four or five lectures. I haven't decided how this is going to look yet. This is going to be a very thorough review over the next five weeks of toxicology and substance abuse. And the beauty of this is that this is heavily tested on the National Registry exam. I think uh, the last test that I saw I had something like 12 questions. I can tell you that as we go along, I will hit the hot button ones that tend to appear more often on no matter what version test that you take. But uh, for our intents and purposes right now, what I want to cover is the first seven to 10 pages that we have in the Brady book. Um, now I'm going to use a set of slides that I used from a previous class a couple of eons ago. It's still very applicable. I reviewed the slides. There's nothing has changed and there's nothing new. These are all based on the National Registry uh, exam at that time. And I'm going to pop, pop that up on a share screen here. In just a moment so I figure out how to do that. Okay. All right, now, uh, as I look at all the chat participants here, I just need for you to give me a real quick heads up on whether or not you can see this or not. I've got 12 participants here, so just type a yes or no if you can see the uh, slideshow. All right, good deal. All right, so let's start from the beginning here. You can tell our pal here is having just a little bit of a time. Anyway, again, my name is Jim Frame. I'm your EMS Medical Director, and we're going to cover toxicology and substance abuse. Now, there's a couple of things that we just want to cover as far as ground rules are concerned. If you have a question, just go ahead and mute your mic and chime in. If you have a question and you want to raise your hand, I'll see it lit up. Uh, like you, I'm still getting used to this uh, program that we just got today at 5 o'clock. Uh, however, it looks like it's really going to be uh, a good one. So we were right into what the definitions are and such. Recognition management of carbon monoxide poisoning, nerve agent poisoning. When do you contact the poison control center? The last time that we started that we didn't quite get through because of technical difficulties, I suspect, on my end. The anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, and assessment and management of. There's only, there's only four real significant ways that a poison or a drug can enter your body, inhaled, ingested, injected, or absorbed. Uh, we do have the toxidromes that we're going to be covering. A toxidrome is a group of drugs that belong to one certain class that all produce the same or similar complaints signs or symptoms within the patient. Subsequently, 
it's called a toxidrome, for instance, cholinergics, anticholinergics, amphetamines, et cetera. You can go right down to, to all eight toxidromes. And you'll see that there's a similarity. Now, each one of these toxidromes has a mnemonic attached to it. You'll drive yourself crazy with it. You really are. But the big ones that you need to know are the cholinergic uh, amphetamine uh, toxidromes and, of course, the substances that we'll get into. We'll, we'll touch on each one as we go along. The uh, uh, sympathomimetic sedatives, opiates, uh, those are all going to be part of it. So somewhere in your book, if you're following along in your book, it's the fourth book. Uh, and we're going to start on page uh, 299. You'll see some... Uh, you'll see that I'll be skipping around these slides because as you can tell at the top, this is the National EMS Education Standards Competencies. And again, for the toxicology and substance abuse, these slides here uh, are, the, are what's going to cover everything on toxicology and substance abuse. If you want me to send you the link, please send me an email so that I can send you a link to these slides. They are online. Uh, just uh, my email is jeframe at comcast.net, and if somebody needs that, uh, go ahead and just punch it up. I'm gonna to type to everybody right now what my email is, and I can send you that link. Okay. Any questions thus far? Okay, paramedics are often called to treat patients for abuse, illicit or illicit drugs. Now, one of, the, one of the first things that we need to get out of the way here is the difference between a drug and a poison. Drugs are something that are legally prescribed or even if they're illicit, they're used for a specific purpose. If you go to Colorado, marijuana is a drug. If you come to Texas, it's a poison or it's illicit or whatever you want to call it. As soon as all 50 states adopt marijuana laws, we could just call it a straight THC drug. However, any drug, including Narcan, can cause side effects, adverse effects, and cause certain signs and symptoms within patients. Know that a drug is therapeutic when given the proper doses for the proper disease or illness, whereas a poison, no matter how it gets into the body, is no good, absolutely no good for the, for the patient. Uh, some of these poisons like a rat poison, will have warfarin in it. Warfarin, of course, is a blood thinner. But in the context of rat poison, it's used as a poison because its doses are extremely high. It causes internal bleeding in the, in the mouse for the rat. They, of course, they die from internal bleeding because they can't clot. Yet warfarin is a drug for human beings, especially if they have atrial fibrillation or deep vein thrombosis, previous pulmonary embolisms, anything like that. They're going to be using blood uh, thinners, and warfarin is one of those blood thinners. Okay, a couple of more definitions. Bioavailability. When you swallow a pill or a capsule or even some liquid medicine, what we do is we then measure about 30 minutes later than one hour later. We draw your blood and see how much is in the bloodstream. And then we measure how much of it is actually going to exert an effect. Now, there's two sides to this. The first being how much gets absorbed. The second is how much is actually available to get the desired effect. For instance, and we'll go over this a little bit later with this drug, but for instance, tricyclic antidepressants. When you take the medication Elevil or nortriptyline or amtriptyline or any one of those really high potent antidepressants, you get almost the full absorption of the entire 100 milligrams or 50 milligrams, depending on what you're taking. You'll get the whole dosage but 90% of it actually binds the protein in the bloodstream and makes it unavailable for any bio effect. Therefore, 10% of what you're swallowing is actually having the effect. However, know this, 
if we already know that 10% is only going to have the effect, we increase the dosage of the pill so that 10% is actually all that you need to saturate 100% of the receptors in your body to get the antidepressant to work. Now, if you follow along with that, there's three wickets to jump through. Number one, that we increase the dosage so that whatever percentage of the free drug is available in the bloodstream exerts, exerts its effect in the body. In other words, it saturates the receptors that it was intended to stimulate or bind to to give the desired effect. In this case, increased chemicals help a depressed person feel better. The bioavailability depends on the drug. Some drugs can be 100% available, like alcohol. Uh, whatever you swallow, zero order kinetics, most if not all the alcohol hits the bloodstream and it hits it pretty hard as you can probably tell after one or two, two drinks. Uh, at the same time, as time goes on, of course, the amount of alcohol that's available in the bloodstream becomes much less because it is now going through the liver and is being metabolized. So know that bioavailability has three components to it. Now, the half-life of drug is when that drug that is available to exert its effect on the receptors in the body, when that drug drops down to half, then we call that half-life. In other words, how long did it take for that substance to get from 100% effect to 50% effect? In other words, half of it was available now to, to bind to the receptors, whereas before 100% of the receptors were bound. That's called half-life. Now, where is that important? Well, for a drug like tricyclic antidepressants, the half-life can be about 12 to 24 hours, which is why a lot of these medications are taken every day, once a day, because after 12 hours to 24 hours, you get a 50% decrease, and then another 50% decrease at 24 hours, so that only um, a certain amount of that is uh, left over, 25% in this case. But... <clears throat> you'll find that dosage res regimens for medications that are like dosed three times a day or four times a day, you'll find that the half-life is usually about two to three hours in those patients. You wait for it to get to 50, then you wait for it to get down a little bit lower. Then the second dose comes in for the six-hour drugs. For the eight-hour drugs, half-lives can be anywhere from four to eight hours and then it's time for the next dose. For instance, most antibiotics that are dosed three times a day. So half-life gives you a pretty good idea and how long the drug hangs around, and that's all based on, you could backtrack a little bit and say that this is all based on how often you take the drug. Again, a once-a-day drug has a longer half-life because we don't need to dose it as much, whereas if you're going to dose something four or five times a day, it's a pretty short half-life, which means you can't miss any doses because if that effect gets too low, what's the point? You're without the effect. And then excretion, how the drug is removed from the body. Uh, most of the time, it's through the kidneys. Sometimes it's through the liver. It depends on what the drug is. Uh, you'll find that a lot of it gets metabolized in the liver and then ultimately ends up either in the... Uh, small or large bowel, or in the case of uh, certain medications such as NSAIDs and such, it's excreted through the kidney. All right, uh, toxicological emergencies for children. You can see a child sitting in the corner there taking pills, uh, probably mother or grandmother's medication that they've left out. Uh, these are accidental poisonings. The intentional or overdose uh, are, are probably the biggest ones. Now, even though children constitute a majority of the number of accidental poisonings that are out there, adults account for 95% of all the deaths attributed to overdoses. So children get into it, they tend to do okay because they've only taken one, two, or three pills, and it's the first time that they've taken it, so the body can kind of sort of make a, a bounce back here 
But the adults, when they take an intentional, uh, they're usually taking the whole bottle. And that's unfortunately one of the problems with the cardiac drugs as well as the tricyclic antidepressants. And we'll get into tricyclics later. All right, so I've got a couple questions here. The first one I want to answer is, Let's see, first pass metabolism, right? When you get into zero order kinetics, when you get into first order and then second order kinetics and such are what they call first or second order metabolism. Again, bioavailability and how the medication is bound and such or inactivated. What you're looking for, whatever bioavailability, no matter what kinetics order, zero, one, or two first pass metabolisms, uh, it, no matter what you do, all we're worried about is bioavailability. In other words, how much of the drug is available to actually exert its effect. Yes, all of this stuff is influenced by it. And if you've got a nice healthy liver that's exposed to Jim Beam every night and you develop the alcohol transferlase enzyme and you really make it available, it's going to take more alcohol each day. Similar with medications, you can develop these kind of tolerances. And we even see that with drug addicts that can have higher tolerances with heroin and and some other medication or some other drugs where they have to take more and more each time to achieve that effect. One of the biggest areas we see is in cancer patients who have chronic pain syndromes and require more and more narcotics to take care of the pain because they can metabolize it a heck of a lot quicker. Most of the studies, if not all the studies, had to do with bioavailability first and second pass metabolism, in the case of alcohol, zero order kinetics. All of these studies had to do with young, healthy individuals. It doesn't necessarily translate or, or uh, can be ascribed to older or very, very young. It's just a good general uh, information that, to have about what we would expect, not only as paramedics in the field, but as physicians in the emergency department, and intensivists in the intensive care units, how long we're gonna have to have this patient under close observation because this is the time frame from the time that they took the overdose until the time that the medication is at least reasonably below 50% bioavailability. And let's see, from uh, Han, with first pass metabolism, a certain routes that should affect bioavailability as well. It, again, they're all intertwined. It's just the way that they're being cleared from the body. Uh, kinetics is a very, or first pass metabolism, second pass metabolism, or uh, zero order kinetics. Are, are fascinating uh, to look at. Most, if not all, drugs out there follow uh, first pass. There's there's a few that do second pass. The the big study, the big one on zero order. Uh, in other words, 50% of it's cleared at specific hours. No matter how much you've got in you, it doesn't depend on how much dosage you got. Like with the first pass metabolisms, you can wipe out almost 80% of the drug. Whereas alcohol, it's 50%, and this is it. This is all that you're going to get each time, no matter what. But yet you can spin up the metabolism in the first or second passes. It's what I didn't want to do is get into too much confusion here because as we start talking more and more about metabolism, you get yourself kind of thinking in, in different directions and such. If you have an interest in, in studying that further, drop me a line, an email or something like that, and I give you some. LLSA articles that we as physicians use to continue our continuing education. And you can kind of read and review that. Much the same way that most of you folks are around for the supraventricular tachycardia uh, series that we uh, put out here just a little while back. It's those type of uh, articles that we read. And then every 10 years, we recertify as, as board certified ER docs. So we'll keep going here as I can find my arrow. All right. So we have routes of absorption. So we're going to start by ingestion. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. Inhalation is going to be straightforward as well. Uh, scene safety. Probably the biggest thing that you have to worry about with any type of poison now. In the last lecture, I talked about organophosphate poisoning where you've got a liquid laying on the ground. And that can be absorbed right through your clothing, right into the skin. Uh, that's 
that's one of the exceptions, obviously. Any kind of hydrazine, uh, chlorine in a liquid form, ammonia, such like that. These are all caustic to the skin, but if you're in prolonged contact with it, obviously in a liquid form, uh, it can absorb into the body and become quite a quite a poison for you. So scene safety, and like we talked about in the last lecture, the one that was busted up, is that PPE and your situational awareness, your SA, is going to be most important here. As an all-hazards paramedic responder, especially you guys are going to be on the fire departments and such, you're going to get on scene in some of these places, and you're going to find that even gasoline, kerosene, diesel fuel, and such can be very caustic, and prolonged contact with the skin can cause systemic effects as well as local effects to the skin. Scene safety is very important. Make sure you're protecting yourself out there. Can you legally take direction from poison control without going through our local OLMC, online medical control? I don't know that you'll have time to call poison control, but if you do call poison control and they give you advice, you may go ahead and do it. It is legal. Uh, they are authoritative and they have legal standing. In other words, one of the first questions a plaintiff's attorney may ask is, doctor, why didn't your emergency department call poison control? Um, it's considered a risk management uh, tool. In other words, an affirmative defense for the doctor or affirmative for the plaintiff. If the doctor says, I called poison control, told them what I had, and they gave me these directions, one, two, three, four, game over. You're fireproof. So can you legally do it? Yeah. Would you call uh, poison control if you had something really weird? Absolutely. Uh, if it looks like you're going to have prolonged scene time, Online medical control should know that you've been in contact with poison control, and this is what you recommended. The reason why you want to do that, poison control has their recorded lines. Online medical control has theirs. Everybody has to be talking to each other. If you want to make it easy on yourself, call online medical control. Uh, remember, they're, if they're giving you orders over the phone and such like that, and you're following them, uh, you'll be completely defended as well. Where you get into trouble, legally, and not only as an ER doc, but as a, a paramedic in the field, is when you don't call on something that's not covered in the protocol. In my protocols, I'll have some toxic, toxicology and substance abuse type protocols. They handle the, really the most common stuff that's out there, but I can't possibly cover everything. The protocol book would look like the U.S. national budget. So what you'd have to do is make a decision. OLMC, poison control. Stings, bites, insects, animals, intravenous drugs. They all kind of speak for themselves. We're talking about everything from a mosquito to a water moccasin or a rattlesnake, and then, of course, people who shoot up everything in the world. Yeah, yeah Sarah's right. Yeah, beware of home quick suicides as well. Hey, guys, got to watch out for that gray drug out there, what they call gray death. Uh, it's a heroin, fentanyl, and a couple other substances that are kind of mixed together. And gray death is when you mix all this stuff together, it looks like a gray paste. I mean, you, it almost looks like you'd stick it in your toothpaste tube uh, and brush your teeth with it. You probably get the same effect. But unfortunately, it's resulted in a lot of fatalities already. And it's only been on the streets maybe the last 150 days maybe 180 days in some areas. Uh, if it's been there longer, I haven't known about it. But I've seen an increased number of people coming in. They have the classic uh, toxidrome symptoms of opioids. Uh, one of the things I go to is respiratory depression and pinpoint pupils. Probably one of the easiest things to go for. Just as an aside, pinpoint pupils, narcotics, or pontine stroke or somebody shined a really, really bright light in their eyes. Uh, there's not very many things that cause pinpoint pupils that, that, re, uh, that react, and arcs tend to, to be the top of the hit parade, depending on the age group. Uh, don't be fooled by the 70 and 80-year-olds. Suicide rate in 70 and 80-year-olds is three times that of any teenage age group combined. Uh, so opioid overdose is a very common way as well. Um, anyway, that was just an aside about pinpoint pupils. The toxidromal opioids will, will be covered later. And then some, of course, are injected. Uh, you know, this is 
uh, it, this could be heroin or, or any kind of opioid fentanyl, of course, being 88 times uh, more powerful than uh, morphine is a uh, is is quite a uh, quite a showstopper. Fentanyl is what we use in the operating room to make sure the patient doesn't feel any pain when we are incising and going into the abdomen, moving all your organs around. Uh, fentanyl is so powerful that you won't feel that. Of course, we combine it with other medications to make sure that you're asleep. But if uh, we start waking you up uh, and we don't have that pain under control, you're, you're going to be an unhappy patient. And then absorption, pesticides are most often, this is the classic organophosphate one that we've uh, talked about. All right, the toxidromes. Now, let's talk about that group of uh, substances that can cause similar or the same symptoms. Any kind of amphetamine, methamphetamine, including cocaine and such, the old nasal decongestions that had pseudoephedrine in it until so they took that out and replaced with uh, phenylalanine. Uh, but the old pseudofeds were an amphetamine-like substance. All you had to do is kind of cook it a certain way in the kitchen. And most of these restlessness, agitation, incessant talking, insomnia, anorexia, dilated pupils, tachycardia, blah, 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 uh, just know that it can also lead to cardiac arrest. And this was a very uh, common cause of death in the Texas area here, especially about five years ago when the bath salts, the K2, and all the other happy stuff came out. They were actually selling it in the corner drugstores, uh, mostly in gas stations and such. And people were doing the bath salts, and then, you know, they were going to bed with them and waking up dead the next day. So it's it was real problematic, which is why it was quickly outlawed very, very quickly in an emergency session of the Texas legislature. But I know the other 50 states have followed as well. Um, your next one, narcotic opiates, we touched on a little bit here, constricted pinpoint pupils or marked respiratory distress. Uh, there may be some physical signs that you've got some needle tracks and such. This is probably the easiest one of all of them because this is the one that you're going to run into a lot out there. Now, with that great debt stuff that I was just telling you about the heroin and fentanyl, what the cartel did was they're trying to, they're trying to get people sucked into this drug. So it's hit the street at $10. And so people can get multiple doses of this stuff for 10 bucks. That's pulled everybody away from the hydrocodone group, the drug pushers that were pushing the hydrocodone at $10 a pill uh, was the last I heard that it was going for. Um, and, but they would give you the whole bottle so you could get 50 or 100 and, and, and sell that. Well, that was pretty lucrative for the drug pushers, but now with great death out there in certain areas of New York City, Baltimore, and I think Miami right now, they've had the most deaths from great death right now, heroin and fentanyl combination. Um, and I think what's happening is that there's a cartel that is selling this stuff at such a cheap price to get everybody addicted to it, and then they're going to start jacking the price up. It's the same thing we saw in the 80s with crack cocaine, uh, poor man's cocaine. People couldn't afford the white powder, so they came up with crack after mixing it with some baking soda and water and then flaming it off, and you had yourself a rock, and there was your crack. And it, it's a, it, They did the same thing. They got on the streets at a very low price, and then drove it up. Drug pushers aren't stupid. They, they know marketing just as well as the marketers do. The simple sympathomimetic drugs, uh, when you're looking at your pseudoephedrines and your amphetamines, metamphetamines and such like that, you might have seen it up in the stimulants. It's down here in the sympathomimetics as well. Uh, be watching for the amphetamine, metamphetamine types. Now, the metamphetamines is obviously Ill illicit and illegal. Uh, these patients are going to come in wild as hell. Uh, you're also going to get real hyperthermic on you and probably even have seizures. As long as you've got a couple to several milligrams of Ativan or Versed or hopefully both in your drug box, you should be able to manage these people pretty well, although Haldol has been shown to be very effective in these patients as well. But know that the hypertension, tachycardia, not too many of these medications cause hypertension. And I want to bring that to your real specific attention right now, that anybody, any test question that has to do with hypertension and tachycardia, you nailed it. It's going to be a sympathomimetic. Now, you differ that from the stimulants. You can get hyper or hypotension with the tachycardia, but 
in the sympathomimetics, including um, uh, two of the uh, favorite ones, the uh, Bivance, the Adderall, and some of the older ADD medications and such, those are amphetamines. And their objective in attention deficit disorder person is to speed up the slow waves in the brain to get them back in the sync with the faster waves in the brain. And once they're all in synchrony, a person can focus. It seems kind of weird to give an attention deficit or a hyperactive child an amphetamine, uh, but this is the uh, pathophysiology and, of course, the uh, pharmacology behind why we use amphetamines in children with ADHD. But beware, hypertension and tachycardia most often, more likely than not, will be a sympathomimetic agent. That question I've seen on the test. Okay. They'll give you a couple other uh, symptoms as well to kind of help you steer you away from like NARC. So they'll give you the dilated pupil piece. They may even bring in a seizure, uh, but they're going to try to distinguish it from the stimulants. And what, they, what it may even look like on the test question is that they won't even list a stimulant as one of the four choices. They're just going to say, you know, do you have, um, you know, antihistamines? Is this an antipsychotic? You know, what is this? So uh, you're going to go back to sympathomimetic. Now, the next one, sedatives and high hypnotics, drowsiness, dissemination, ataxia, slurred speech. Those are all the real big uh, signs and symptoms. The ataxia, slurred speech, confusion, respiratory depression, you know, that's, that's just about everything, including the legal stuff. I give somebody some Flexeril and they come in and they look like they're intoxicated. If they take too many Flexeril, it acts like a TCA, a tricyclic, and it could be a, you know, a big problem. But I didn't see anything on the last couple of tests that told me that they were testing the sedatives and hypnotics, just be aware it's a toxidrome. And then the cholinergic and anticholinergic to round out the major toxidromes are, are listed there as well. And again, I don't see a lot of people overdosing on anything except the antihistamines. Now, sometimes people get a handful of Benadryl. They say that they can't sleep, so they take 25 no sleep. They go to 50 milligrams, no sleep. Next thing you know, they're taking 15 or 16 of them, and they get the opposite effect. Instead of being drowsy and a little bradycardic and lethargic, they turn out to be tachycardic, blurred vision, and then they can even go delirious on you. So be aware of the antihistamines as well. All right. We'll keep... Um, uh, we'll keep going down the, the list here. Okay. These are straightforward definitions here. Drug abuse, use of drugs that cause harm, habituation, psychological dependence on a drug or a drug. Habituation, the most classic case of habituation where there's no physical dependence, but there's psychological dependence on it are marijuana. Uh, we can talk about its effect in the purified form, THC, for pain relief, glaucoma relief, such like that. But again, the patient isn't craving it. The patient's doing it to get rid of pain or to relieve symptoms of glaucoma or the stress of cancer and such. But there's no physical craving that they get up and they say, I got to have this or else I'm going to go into some sort of withdrawal. Another classic one, and you wouldn't even think this, but LSD. The old 60s drug, the, uh, the hell was it, lysergic acid, diamethylene, whatever it is. LSD, classically in the 60s, uh, especially out of Harvard University, Timothy Leary is the uh, sociologist, uh, guy that liked to do a lot of social experiments, did a lot of drug experience as well. Uh, gave healthy individuals some LSD and such, and they found that there was no physical dependence. In other words, a person didn't crave it. They just were looking for the, the high, a good trip or a bad trip, whether there's hallucinations involved or such, you know, that was really uh, defined what the good trip and the bad trip was all about. The problem with LSD is that it altered your situational awareness. And that may be a little bit more out of the scope of the lecture here than we want to talk about, but just to give you a background on it, LSD was making a little bit of a resurgence back in the 90s, but they found it to be um, just a little bit too dangerous and too many people were having bad trips. And so even the 
people who are looking for these bad trips found alternatives such as crack cocaine and and bath salts, the K2, and some of the other things that are out there. So uh, LSD is a problem, but it's not a big problem. Not as big as the other things that we talked about. Okay, physical dependence. This is the hot, hot button issue. Not only do alcoholics have this, uh, patients that are, have suffered alcohol abuse, but cocaine, heroin, and all the big, the big guys, the, the biggest of the big out there, they're all physically, no kidding, dependent on this. They will go through a withdrawal. They crave it. They'll commit crimes to get the money to get these drugs, uh, and they'll kill for it. Unfortunately for them, they will also die from these uh, these medications as well as they get higher and higher doses. Psychological dependence, we just talked about tolerance, physiological adaptation to a drug. We talked about that a little bit earlier. The classic case, the cancer patient requires more and more pain medications to help them relieve their pain uh, as they go. As they go further into their treatment, this week, it's 25 micrograms of fentanyl that they've got on a patch on their shoulder. Then the next thing you know, they got two patches on their shoulder. The next thing you know, uh, they're up to 100 micrograms. And then supplementing it with oxycodone or one of the other uh, big oral medications as well, including Dilaudid. Withdrawal. Now, what happens when you stop a medication abruptly? You can get withdrawal symptoms with clonidine uh, or some of the other uh uh, medications that are out there. If you stop too quickly, you can get rebound something. We call, we call it all withdrawal syndrome, although when it comes to stopping hypertensive meds and such, where you get the rebound malignant uh, uncontrolled hypertension and go into crisis, uh, that's more just, we don't call that mostly a uh, withdrawal syndrome, we just call it you know an abrupt stop and non-compliance. Whereas withdrawal is classically thought of as a person who cuts out something called turkey. So somebody who's been drinking for 10 years and then stops drinking, all of a sudden, day two, 48 hours to about day three and a half, four, uh, will start going into delirium tremens, and that's a pretty wicked withdrawal syndrome. Narcotic withdrawal, benzodiazepine withdrawals, we've seen all of that. Uh, patients who use things uh, chronically, but opioid withdrawals tend to be the more common. Alcohol withdrawals, are the most dangerous. These alcohol withdrawals will kill. Narcotic withdrawals, patients have a real, real bad time, but they tend not to die of it. They just have a real, real bad time, uh, whereas alcoholics will actually die. So, And then drug addiction, you know what that is, antagonist, you know, Narcan is the classic here. Patient takes a narcotic, you get in there, and all the narcotic receptors are filled. The patient's bradycardic, respiratory depression, pinpoint pupils, lethargic, maybe getting ready to stop breathing. You give a dose of Narcan and they wake up. The antagonist goes right in there and displaces the drug off the receptors. I mean, actually kicks it out so that the receptors are now blocked and the narcotic can no longer exert an effect and you get immediate reversal. It'd be nice if we had that for alcohol too. Potentiation, that's a one plus one equals three. Potentiation is the definition of one plus one equals three. I take this drug, I get an effect. I take this drug, I get an effect. When I take both of them together though, I get a three to five times an effect. I mean, these are really wicked together. The heroin fentanyl is another example of it, the part of the gray death that we were talking about earlier. A one plus one equals three. Potentiation is its, its uh, um, is that big enhancement. Now, this goes along with, but not quite, synergism, where two substances in which the effects are greater than the independent effects. That's another one plus one equals three. But potentiation, you take one drug, heroin, and you enhance it with fentanyl, and you get three to five times the effect. In other words, it pushes the effect of one of them really, really high. Synergism one plus one equals three, where you have to take both drugs to get the higher effect. You may say to me, that's a really fine line. I don't know that I can tell the difference between potentiation and synergism. The answer is, if you've got a really hot drug and you need to kick that effect really hard, a whole lot harder, 
then that's potentiation. If you need both drugs to achieve a certain effect, that's synergism. Potentiation tends to be a little bit more dangerous. All right, any questions thus far? Anybody have anything that they want to bring up? Amanda says no. Is she speaking for everybody? Jonathan says no. My question's about Narcan. Go ahead, Adrian. You want to mute? You want to unmute your microphone and talk to all of us? All right, so I got two questions here. The first one is from Adrian. Uh, we gave a male unresponsive that used cocaine. You know, there's a thing out there. Um, I don't know if we're going to get into it or not. I, I hope we do. I'm, I didn't have a chance to review all 168 slides, but you have this coma cocktail that's out there. When a patient comes in the emergency department unresponsive and they're young, uh, I tend to use Narcan, 2 milligrams, followed by thiamine, 100 milligrams, followed by and AMP D50. Now that's empiric treatment in the field. You give all three of those medications to see if they wake up with something because all three of them tend to work fairly quickly. In the case of thiamine, uh, you're looking for a Wernicke's encephalopathy in an alcoholic. So if a patient's got a real hardcore, no kidding alcohol history, you go ahead and give them thiamine. I don't know very many protocols where they've got thiamine in the field. But you do have Narcan and you do have D50. If you don't have the blood sugar instrumentation right there, you give them a D50. Look, if the patient's sugar is 500 and you give them a D50, you bump it up to 600, no big deal. I can drive it down in an hour. But if the patient's blood sugar is 20, then they have a greater than 50% chance of death at anything below 30. By giving them an amp, you get them up to 100, you've saved their life. So that's why we give D50. You just give it. If you're unsure, just give it. Now, the coma cocktail uh, of the Narcan and D50 and thiamine is on some of the National Registry exams. They won't mention the thiamine. If they do, fine, throw it in there. But Narcan and D50 is your, is your go-to drugs. Now, Sarah writes... Can you talk about using ketamine as a sedative for these excited delirium patients? I know you mentioned Haldol and Versed. I did mention Haldol and Versed, especially patients who are having delirium. Uh, if you use ketamine because your patient is getting particularly violent, I don't have a problem with that. Just know that you've got an airway uh, issue. Now, you're trained paramedics, and subsequently you give them whatever you want as long as you're aware of the side effects and you're prepared to handle an airway. In the case of ketamine, yes, of course, they're still breathing, but now that we've got a relaxed cardiac sphincter in the esophagus, uh, if they've had anything to eat within the last six hours, you're going to know exactly what it is and how much they ate because it's going to be up very quickly. Uh, ketamine is a great medication for a lot of things. I like it for the RSI, especially in trauma. It doesn't drop the blood pressure. You've got a 60 pressure. You give ketamine, the pressure's still 60. If the pressure's... 220 in a stroke patient, you have ketamine, the pressure is still going to be 220. That's the unfortunate thing about it. It doesn't affect a high blood pressure. The beauty of it, it doesn't affect a low blood pressure, and ketamine won't make a high blood pressure even higher unless they have reemergence nightmares or something. That's something we could talk about later. But ketamine is a great drug to disassociate and get them calmed down. I like Haldol and uh, Ativan together. We like Haldol and Benadryl together. Uh, so that we don't get into the cholinergic side effects and such, and you kind of knock it down with the uh, with the Benadryl. Um, but yeah, you know what? In the case of EMS, and I spent a lot of years in the field, just like Jane had uh, when I was with the Chicago Fire Department back in the 70s, we had Haldol. We didn't have ketamine, but we would stick people Haldol 10 milligrams IM, Benadryl 50 milligrams IM, and hopefully they'll calm down in about five to seven minutes. Now, this is still means that the paramedic is at risk for injury because we've got a particularly violent patient. So I don't know what your successes will be in a violent patient of getting an IV started, 
The beauty of ketamine, just like Haldol, is that you can stick it IM. Make sure you got the appropriate dose. Can't use the IV dose of ketamine IM. Uh, the patient's not going to feel much of an effect, and they're going to still going to be a big fight. At the same token, uh, Haldol tends to be absorbed rapidly from the muscle as well, and you get a good effect. So either one, Haldol or ketamine, is fine with me. Now with the... Um, how do you identify and treat drug-seeking patients? Um, <laughs> that question has plagued emergency physicians for since they invented Tylenol coating. Uh, back in the 60s, the most abused drug in the world was Valium. Patients would come in the emergency room pretending that they were having some sort of seizure, some sort of anxiety and such. They get the Valium, they get a prescription for Valium, go home. It was the number one cause of death in the 60s most abused prescription in the 60s. Now, as we jump uh, fast forward in the 70s and 80s, we start seeing more of a narcotic uh, flavor to the abused drugs. But how do you identify the drug seeker? Sometimes they're pretty, pretty obvious. They come in with pain syndrome complaints that you can't prove. I got a migraine headache. I've got low back pain and such. You get a CT scan of the head, it's negative. CT scan of the back, it's negative. Yet, you know, they give you all the signs and symptoms. We get onto a site, uh, prescription uh, restriction program site that the state of Texas runs, Oklahoma runs it too, where you plug in the patient's name and uh, address or name and social security number, whatever identifying features that you have, and it pulls up every single narcotic prescription that the patient's been written for the past 10 years. Some of these people come up with one or two prescriptions, in which case you kind of roll with it. Uh, the best I had was one that had about 45 pages. She had uh, 60 prescriptions from 25 different providers located 20 and uh, had them filled at 27 different pharmacies. Okay, so she was kind of a clear cut case and, and, and that, but y you never know. The patients, when you get on the scene, if you just go ahead and treat their pain because you'll have a calmer patient, of course, you don't want a violent encounter and such like that. I don't have a problem with that. We've all been in the field, and I understand your uh, concern. There was a violent patient that we had a while back. She got really indignant with the paramedics and started throwing stuff around the back of the rig. When one of the paramedics had just said, okay, we'll give it to you. For her toothache, they gave her 200 micrograms of fentanyl. By the time she got to me, of course, you know, she's on Pluto. And so, but yet, it was a nice, safe transport. And they didn't have to deal with that. Now, in a more controlled environment of the ER, where I got a lot more medications, and a lot more people to hold them down, a lot more space to, to wrestle with them if we have to, uh, that's, that's where we start getting into uh, taking care of potentially violent patients. But if you got a dangerous situation, by all means, just do what you got to do so that you can keep the transport safe. Now, let's see, with Narcan, do you recommend titrating the capnography, respiratory drive in the field? I asked due to patients using opiates to depress stimulants. You know, and that's always a danger when you got the mixed uh, medication person, when you got the person who's being their own physician and they're taking substance A and they think, I'm going to avoid some of the side effects here, so I'm going to take substance B, and the next thing you know, they took too much of A, so they have to add a little bit more of B. They get a synergistic effect between the two, or worse yet, they're competitive with each other through the what they call the P450 system in the liver, and one potentiates the other, and uh, that's when you get the real problems here. I'll tell you what we don't let you guys carry flumazil in the, in the flum, flumazil. Uh, Romazicon is its trade name, uh, which reverses benzodiazepines the same way Narcan reverses narcotics. We can reverse a benzodiazepine. That it's not quite as dramatic. They don't jump up, throwing up or anything, but like they do at Narcan. But you don't use that Romazicon in the field because that may be the medication that's keeping the patient from having a seizure. And if I unload the benzodiazepine, we're going to have seizures. It's the same thing that has to do with your question about the opiates. Look, if you've got an overdose patient who's sleeping and the capnography is 45 and the heart rate's 90 and the blood pressure's 120 over 80, I'm going to put the patient on the stretcher 
I'm going to do a physical assessment and I'm going to gently get them to the hospital and not give them anything. Why? Because they're peaceful, they're at rest, and they're in no danger. Your job as paramedics is to intervene, not to preempt. So if you think, well, you know, it looks like they took a narcotic overdose and they've got a normal vital signs, why give Narcan? You're going to just cause problems out there in the field. I mean, they're going to wake up from this thing. They're going to be pissed as hell. Or they could become violent. Um, or like you said, they took the opioid uh, to be synergistic with another medication uh, so that they could get the desired effect of the other medication more enhanced. So with the unresponsive patient who's vomiting, who can't control their gag reflex, pinpoint pupils, respiratory rate is six, I give them Narcan. But don't look for problems. If your patient's stable from a vital sign standpoint, you know that you've got their airway covered. It's just a matter of just watch them closely by all means. Just observe them, bring them in. All right, let's see where we're at. Patient assessment, hey, no problem. Uh, toxicology emergencies are generally considered medical emergencies. Good call, fellas. I'm glad you probably sat up all night making that slide. Uh, patients who have taken an overdose may be dangerous. We just covered that ad nauseum. So we're going to get into primary assessment. Now, scene size up, of course, is situational awareness. So that's going to be PPE when necessary, like, the, for instance, the organophosphate, chlorine gas, carbon monoxide, patients unresponsive in their house, you walk in, you don't smell anything, you treat the patient, yet you walk into the garage with smoke, with carbon monoxide in the air, enclosed space, car running and such, open, ventilate, get the patient outside as soon as possible. And that even goes along with the organophosphate patient we talked about the other day. Get them out of the liquid, get them to another part, preferably outside, and hose them down and get them decontaminated, stripped down, IV, atropine, airway if you got to do it, and get them into the hospital as soon as possible because they're going to take about 10 milligrams of atropine probably within the first hour. But the overarching paradigm here is the scene size up. When you get on scene, situational awareness, personal protective gear, that is hit very hard than the National Registry. It's in everybody's protocols, and there's even SOPs on as many fire departments as well as ambulance services that will hold you in violation of policy or violation of the SOP uh, should you not protect yourself. And these are all the reasons uh, for it. In case anybody wants to go one step further with protection, you see what the Texas committee uh, did that's going to come out to the full legislature is that they passed a law or they passed a recommendation to the Senate, uh, House of Representatives to allow EMTs and paramedics to carry weapons now for their own protection. That came about if they had Dallas paramedic uh, probably four or five days ago was shot uh, by a uh, active shooter. Uh, busted out into the street. I don't know the details. If you know more than I do, please feel free to chime in, but actually shot the paramedic. In this particular case, there is ample time for that paramedic to have drawn his weapon and either shoot back or at least get into a crouching position where he'd be less of a target and such. So along with the weapon comes training. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this is uh, training common sense versus actually having weapons in the field. I see this as a five alarm disaster, uh, but uh, it's Texas and we like our guns down here. All right. Now, patients who have taken an overdose may be dangerous. So you call law enforcement or a crisis unit if necessary. If a patient takes an overdose and is conscious, alert, and awake, the only person that can take them into protective custody is a police officer. If police refuse to do it, or if police are not on the scene, you cannot take this patient against their wishes or their will while they're conscious, alert, or into times four. Once they go unresponsive, you can take them. But you, as paramedics, cannot take them into protective custody, even if they're actively suicidal. You cannot take them into protective custody. I don't see too many police officers out there that would get uh, combative with you by saying, I'm not going to take him to protective custody because he's conscious alert or into times four. Yeah, but he just swallowed a whole bottle of pills. Some police officers will roll with it. Others will say, 
he doesn't want treatment. Well, it's going to depend on your local uh, jurisdictions, but uh, for the most part, the Supreme Court has held up on many, many occasions that a patient has a right to accept or deny treatment under any circumstances until they are no longer to make that, no longer capable of making a decision. Then you can trigger implied consent after that. But, you know, that's a suicidal patient. That's the overdose patient who's still conscious and alert. You just got to watch your, your legalities here. It's, it's advisable in those situations, especially those situations, to have police officer on the scene with you. Okay, so let's see, uh, let's see, from Brenda, Adrian and Brenda, if police won't, I had this happen, police cancel the ambulance, is this abandonment if we leave? You know, that's all situational. Um, if you've made contact with the patient, the patient expressly stated to you that they don't want any treatment or anything like that, you leave, that's fine. If the police even won't let you in the house, you just make that very, very clear and documented because you're not going to get into a fight with the police out there. I mean, you know, they're still carrying the guns. But, you know, if you interfere with a crime scene, you interfere with the uh, official duties of a police officer while in the performance of his duty, that can be you know, a pretty serious misdemeanor charge for you as well. Uh, so there are a lot of good reasons. If the police officer says stay out, you just stay out. You document it. Police wouldn't even let us on the scene. Uh, they wouldn't even acknowledge if this was a crime scene. All this stuff is going to have to be very accurately documented. And then you call online medical control and say, we're on the scene. This is what we think we have. But the police aren't letting us on the scene. Uh, they're telling us to cancel the ambulance and go back to quarters. What's your recommendation? And online medical control is going to say, yeah, don't fight with the police. Get back to quarters. It's all on tape now. It's time stamped. And this is probably one of your best protections. Now, Adrian had brought up here that he was on the impression that if they made the comment with suicide in it, we had to. If a patient expresses that they're suicidal, okay, would you like to go to the hospital? No, I don't want to go to the hospital you're going to have to take them into protective custody and only police officers can do that. You can't take a suicidal patient in protective custody. You can take a child in protective custody insofar if the parents are not present or a legitimate uh, uh, person that has fiduciary responsibility, like, you know, a family member and such like that. Uh, if a child is really seriously hurt, then there would be implied consent from the parents, even though the parents aren't there. But as far as adults are concerned, it gets real dicey. And this is where you need to get in touch with online control. I've been forced with uh, several decisions over the past many years where they've called up and said, hey, we got something really strange going on here. And so you can't cover the law for every contingency, just like you can't cover every substance out there. Uh, or every protocol for every disease process out there. This is, this is going to have to be with your good judgment. But as a general law, law, L-A-W, law, as a general law, police officers can only take people into protective custody. The suicidal patient who's conscious, alert, or into times four is not mandated and can refuse treatment. Okay. Now, if they come to the emergency department, or they're brought in under protective custody, then they get a mandatory uh, three-day evaluation. Such at that point, uh, the law triggers the hospital to bring them into a psychiatric facility. We could get into a legal discussion about this. I'll have a good medical legal lecture that'll be posted online, hopefully here within the next, uh, well, next cycle of lectures that I give. And I go into all of those legalities that uh, we encounter. Let's see. Um, it's a bad situation. Patient is heading into respiratory problems, narcotics. Yeah, I get it. There's a person, a classic case was the California case that went up to the Supreme Court. A young lady, about 25 or 26 years old, was a model, couldn't get a jab, uh, took a whole bottle of barbiturates. 911 is called, well, at that time it wasn't 911, but uh, emergency was called and paramedics and EMTs arrived and they had to stand at the doorway. The patient refused to be brought to the hospital. So they just waited there until she went unconscious. Then they were able to take her to the hospital. Again, the Supreme Court has already ruled on this issue. It's a constitutional right of every person out there 
if they're of right mind, uh, in their right mind, obviously, if they're not slurring their speech, showing altered mental status and such, they have a right to, to refuse treatment, much the same way uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have a right to refuse blood, even though it's going to be life-saving. You can't tell them what to do with their body. Once they go unconscious, you can do whatever you want to patients that are suicidal and such. Uh, I got off on the Jehovah's Witnessing, and I probably shouldn't have, but Jehovah's Witnesses, if they've acknowledged that they're a Jehovah Witness, even after they go unconscious, you're not allowed to give blood if they're over the age of 18 and they've expressed that they are Jehovah Witness. That's a whole different lecture. We can get into that later. From uh, the, Since it's not normal or rational thinking or acting to kill yourself, how is this not considered altered mental status? Not arguing just goes against everything I've been taught before. I want you to be able to distinguish, Jonathan, between altered mental status where the patient is not alert oriented times four, sluggish or slurred in their speech, their concentration is poor, et cetera, versus a person who is perhaps expressing suicidal thoughts, but looking at you sober as a judge and telling you, yeah, I am suicidal. I have no access to weapons. I have no access to this or that. There's no immediate threat around the area and such. You need a police officer to take them into protective custody. They're not altered mental status. Okay. And what you've been taught before, um, the law has evolved as the years has gone on. And certain jurisdictions have probably given you some leeway on it. But here in Texas, uh, the law enforcement standard is only they can take people into protective custody. So it, it gets real fine line there. And I think the best thing that you can do for me, Jonathan, is that when you get on the scene of somebody like this who's absolutely refusing care, alert or into times four appropriate normal tone voice and um, coherent, um, but expressing suicidal thoughts and a police officer does not want to take them into protective custody, you're going to get into false imprisonment at best. And perhaps if he's held for longer than 24 hours or across the state line, you could get nailed for kidnapping. Now, these are all intentional battery torts that can be sued not only in the criminal courts, but also in tort where you can be sued without the criminal penalties attached, but you could be sued for that false imprisonment. So again, online medical control has to get involved here. If I, as a physician, say, no, you're going to have to let this patient go, you're going to say, okay, fine, you're fireproof, which is why these kind of borderline cases really need to be discussed with online medical control. Okay, let's see what we got from a primary assessment. Uh, OPQRST, I'm sure that's been hammered into all of you guys. Sample history's been uh, hammered. What you want is the who, what, when, where, and why. Was it ingested, injected, absorbed, or inhaled? You know, if you see needles there, probably take a stab in the dark there about it being injected. If there's pills laying all over the place, once again, there's a good chance they were swallowed. People don't get too inventive. Um, especially when they overdose, they bought a particular illicit substance from a drug dealer in a certain form, and they know how to take that form. Where it may get a little dicey is cocaine, uh, heroin. They could be absorbed through nasal passages, or they can be injected. You can be ingested, but you know, I'd hate to take $300 of cocaine, put it in my stomach, and then have the hydrochloric acid destroy it. Uh, it's not the intent of them getting high. Uh, but, yeah, beware. Uh, beware. Anything can go anywhere. So who, what, when, where, and why, and how, what route would, did it take, if known? Got into all that. And then we get into secondary assessments, uh, especially if the person takes an overdose and tries to hang themselves at the same time, uh, takes an overdose and they live on the second or third floor and they go to a window because they got altered situational awareness. They minimize their danger. They think they can fly. 
uh, you know, whatever, you know, they've seen Guardians of the Galaxy 2, think they're Drax, go over to the balcony, take a tumble. So there's going to be altered mental status in patients sitting at the bottom of a balcony from two or three stories up, uh, still alive from a vital sign standpoint. You have to consider, does these physical findings fit the injuries that are here, or is there something else going on from an overdose standpoint? which is why I like to get into altered mental statuses and prophylactic intubations pretty quickly. So I can at least take that off the table. I don't have to worry about aspiration. But managing injuries and then, of course, document, document, document everything. How do I handle a broken needle in the vein? Um, yeah, stabilize and transport. If they, if they break a needle in their arm, uh, you know, the old ways of putting a tourniquet in, on the arm and bringing them in, you can do that, you know, if it was especially one of the old, uh, you know, 25 gauge needles that's been passed around to the last 18 people. Um, it's probably getting a little worn out. And so you could break the needle off. If that thing does embolize and go, well, through the vein, it's going to go to the heart from the arms, um, you know, and get stuck in the heart and such, we'll be looking for it. There's no real needle out there that's so big, like a spinal needle where they slip it into their vein and and, and break something like that off. So you could put a tourniquet on it, especially if you can see part of the needle stick. I don't have a problem with you pulling it out because if it does embolize, we got bigger problems. I'd rather pull that out on the scene rather than waiting to get to the hospital and find out embolized to the heart, which is just a tad more complicated effort to get that out. But, you know, it's happened to us in the emergency room as well, where you put in a central line and use a guide wire, and then all of a sudden, the, just from the uh, diastolic action, the wire gets sucked into the heart, you know. And so you have to go chase it with a retriever and such. And it's, it's a little bit messy, quite embarrassing. And, of course, you know, there's a lot of interest that committees at the hospital get very uh, touchy about doctors doing that kind of stuff so if there's an opportunity for you to pull the needle pull it if there's no opportunity tourniquet bring them in you can tourniquet an extremity all day so it's not a big deal okay uh going further on the questions here let's see how do you handle broken needle stabilized transport i mean completely in the vein sounds like a lot of paperwork too absolutely uh, welcome to america uh tort system is alive and well lawyers are doing fairly well in this country uh, and they do very well because of cases like paramedics screwing things up and how does paramedic screw things up very rarely do they screw things up what they screw up is documenting what they did in the field and then find out when they get on the witness stand they get a plaintiff's lawyer that blows up their chart into a three foot by five foot chart red line circle every misspelled word poor grammar they'll circle that and they'll say look this paramedic can't write spell or otherwise put together two words to make a sentence here how are we to believe that he gave good care out there especially since the patient died and this is very compelling for the jury. As a matter of fact, when I was doing risk assessment for cases like this as a defense attorney, uh, if we looked at the documentation, the documentation was very poor, we tended to settle, which meant the paramedic didn't admit fault, but we go through a peer review process and more likely than not, they either had their license suspended, they went for remedial training, or they were outright revoked. So good documentation, however, is gonna make it defensible, at least give us an explanation for what you did. You may still end up getting sued at the end where your company has to pay out some money, but at least you get to hang on to your license as long as your justifications are uh, within reasonableness standards. Um, yeah, poor documentation. I mean, that doesn't mean that every report that you write has to resemble the winning entry into an essay contest. I'm not saying that it has to be perfect, but correct what's obvious. I mean, spell check and grammar check, that's, that's nothing. If you're writing reports, you know, dictionary. Oh, I don't know who's writing reports these days anymore. I think everything's EMR. All right, uh, let's see. Where are we at? Well, we're about 9.10. We're getting in a secondary assessment. We just talked about the guy that was at the bottom of the balcony and fell there because he overdosed and thought that he was just stepping off a curve when he went off a second story. 
uh, monitor patient's condition, reprioritize the status. Now, look, the guy that vaults off the second or third floor window or, or balcony and hits the ground and is still conscious, alert, and awake, you wonder, geez, how the heck are you conscious, alert, and awake? Be thinking PCP, LSD, psilocybin. Be thinking of the hallucinogenics. Be thinking of the medications that were supposed to give him some sort of great trip or a great high and it turned out badly for him and now you're battling the effects of a narcotic or an LSD or a PCP or something on the ground with this patient who's very restless and yet has injuries. These people are going to be the toughest ones to get under control. I like the answer from previous. If the patient's got that many injuries and is thrashing all over the place, guess what they're going to get? Vitamin K. I, and not the real vitamin K. I mean ketamine. They're going to get ketamine. They're going to get an IV push, one to two milligrams IV push per kilo, one to two milligrams IV push per kilo. And once I get them dissociative, then I'm either going to put the mask on them or I'm going to tube them. And then I'm going to start addressing their injuries and their priorities. More times than that, second or third floor falls, they have an LD 50, 50% 50 or more will survive those falls. When you get to the fourth floor, it's right at 50%. Anything above fifth floor, yeah, their, their outcomes aren't very good. But you, you can anticipate at least a busted femur and a broken pelvis, obviously neck injury, even with the PCP in them. Um, and you can expect some sort of pneumothorax or some broken ribs. The bottom line being is that the patient who's thrashing about seems to be delirious or psychotic after a fall like this. Don't attribute the whole thing to the fall. Be thinking toxic substance. Okay. All right, emergency medical care. We're going to start getting into treatments now and assessments. And what we're going to do this evening now is we're going to break off. Uh, this is completes the first lecture of what looks to be probably five lectures. So for the next four weeks, we'll be hitting the next piece of the uh, toxicology and substance abuse here. We'll pick it up from emergency medical care going forward. And we'll start covering uh, the chapter. Uh, let's see, that was chapter. Well, chapter eight, uh, toxicology and substance abuse. We'll just keep right on going through it. And again, if you want the link to the slides so that you can look them over yourself, absolutely. Just drop me an email, and I'll and I'll uh, drop the link right back at you. So if there's no further questions, uh, I think uh, we're going to uh, terminate here. Yes, you want to ask a question about anti- hey, Dr. Frame, when do you want to do Hang on, I got one more question here. I'm sorry. Uh, could I ask a question about anticholinergic? Okay, sorry. Absolutely, Brenda. You know, when I look at muscarinic poisonings and such, I'm looking at, you know, the obvious signs and symptoms that come out. Um, I was uh, actually looking at that not just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact. We treat it the same as uh, uh, organophosphate poisoning. And the answer is organophosphates are going to have some muscarinic effects. They're all going to be common in the same or similar type of uh, toxidromes. Um, so, yes and no. Uh, atropine is going to be very, very good for that. Uh, for the nicotinic effects, uh, there's not really a whole lot that you're going to do for, for those effects except to recognize the symptoms, and it kind of backs up the anticholinergics here. But... Uh, 
Yeah, organophosphate is mostly an atropine 2 p.m. Uh, some of the other muscarinic effects that you get from some of the other medications are going to be specific to that. And it's not so much reversal of the muscarinic effects as it is calming them down. So ativan, versed, and such would be probably more important in, that, in those cases. Now, mushroom poisoning. A uh, patient might have sludge symptoms and lactation, diet, and cardiac arrest. Yeah, it's, uh, these can get away from you pretty quickly, which is why that atropine has to be right there. Um, you can get the salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastric emptying, vomiting uh, pretty quickly. And if you're not tuned in real quick that this is organophosphate, uh, the patient would probably die because they didn't get atropine in a timely manner. Uh, because when they go bradycardic, it's not normal to bradycardic taste systole uh, within a you know four hours. I mean, it's it goes very quickly. You can actually put that within a two to three minute time frame. So depending on the extent of the exposure, severe exposures are not going to have a prayer. Whereas moderate exposures, like the kid I was talking about the other day when I was in Chicago, uh, where he had the organophosphates uh, spill on him because he was trapped under the rack. Um, he required the atropine from us. And like I said, he had eight milligrams by the time he hit the hospital and then got another two while he was in the emergency room. And hell, we were, I don't think we we're 15 minutes down the road to the hospital. I mean, we, that was back in the day when you could actually take the ambulances up to 80, 90 miles per hour. I and mean, we hustled this kid in pretty quickly and um, he, he survived it. But back to your question about muscarinic effects, um, you gotta be all over it. You gotta be all over what's going on with this patient. If you got a solid solid sludge history and this patient's going bradycardic, you probably bet the farm that it's organophosphate. Yeah, mushrooms, you know, psilocybin especially uh, is a hallucinogenic and it can give you mis mixed symptoms. And if the person's been shrooming out there for a little bit, and picks up an angel cap or something uh, uh, along with, you know, one of the psilocybin uh, uh, mushrooms, uh, you can have a, uh, you can have a mixed picture as well. Uh, we'll as a matter of fact, uh, probably around the third lecture, we're going to be talking about mushrooms and the uh, five types of mushrooms and such, and which one you got to worry about, which one uh, it's just uh, supportive care with. But uh, pretty scary stuff when people start shrooming on their own out in the uh, forest there and start picking their own mushrooms. It it gets pretty dicey. And about twice a year, I, I get people in the emergency room because they pick the wrong stuff. So, dying about 10 minutes and same time mushroom tea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is all going to be fun. Brenda, I want you to hold that question for when we hit the mushrooms. And then uh, let's dissect your question a little bit um, um, a little bit more carefully uh, so that I can help you distinguish between the poisons that come along with the angel caps and such versus the psilocybins, which tend to be more hallucinogenic. Um, um, we get into a different type of toxidrome there. Oregonians have guns and pick mushrooms. And you guys have assisted suicide up there. I wonder if all that kind of ties together. I'm not sure. All right, Jane, did you have anything for me? Just uh, when did you want to do these other lectures? Uh, I think you had us down for, didn't you schedule us in for like the rest of the decade? Um, let's see. <laughs> no, I was waiting on you, sir. The only thing I scheduled was uh, first Fridays of the month. You know, first, are, yeah, first, first. is everybody in the group here that's listening in right now, uh, is everybody stuck on a Monday or can we switch these around a little bit? Because I don't want to be waiting two weeks before I give you the second, third one. You're going to have some form of extinction here if you're trying to learn this stuff as a big batch. It's it's easiest to do it as a batch. So I'd be willing to, uh, to do the 13th, which is a Saturday night. I'm looking at my schedule here and I'm not going to touch Mother's Day. I'll maybe some personal bodily harm to me. But 19, 20, 21, 23, 24, 25, I'm available. So uh, I'll give you those dates again. 13, 19, 20, 21, 23, 24. 13 is bad, though. You can grab one or two. Of, you can grab one or two of those days. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. 
Okay. I'll grab, uh, uh, what do you want, two of those dates, any of those? Yeah, any two. Yes. Sorry, my internet is terrible tonight. No worries. I like your program that you got. You said two of those dates? Yep. Give me two okay. and we'll, we'll get All through right. it. All right, well, I'll grab two and post them on the, uh, the old and Okay, and I'll need that video from you if we can figure out how to get it from your computer to mine. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I'll just ship you the computer. You can figure it out. All right.